Okay. Hi, I'm very excited to introduce Jeffrey Foote, who is going to be here today with us to talk about treatment and approach, a different approach to addiction. And before we start more diving into some of the questions, I would like to introduce Jeffrey and has a very, very remarkable background. So Jeffrey is the co-founder of the Center for Motivation and Change in Manhattan and Berkshire, nationally recognized clinical research specialist scientist who has received federal grant funding for his work on motivational treatment approaches and substance abuse treatment research focused on the implementation of evidence-based treatments. Jeffrey was a former psychologist for the New York Mets for 11 years and continues in sports psychology as an independent performance consultant to professional athletes. Before co-founding before co-founding the Center for Motivational and Change in 2003, Dr. Foote was the deputy director of the Division of Alcohol Treatment and research at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City, as well as a senior research associate at the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University. Dr. Foote also served as the chief of substance, as the chief of the Smithers Addiction Treatment and Research Center, as well as director of evaluation and research between 1994 and 2001. He is the co-author of award-winning book, Beyond Addiction, How Science and Kindness Help People Change. And he's also the contributor to two workbooks combining strategies from the craft and motivational interviewing approach, the Parents 20-Minute Guide and the Partners 20-Minute Guide, which offer specific tools and practice in evidence-based strategies for helping a loved one change. And before I'm going to ask my questions, I want to share briefly why this is so meaningful for me and why I'm so excited that I have the opportunity to talk with you today, Jeffrey. Um, when I found out two years ago that my son had a serious addiction to Xanax, I was going and search addiction 101, so to say. Mm -hmm. And in my research, I found out about the Center for Motivation and Change really thinking, and we live on the West Coast, maybe yeah. there is a way that I can get Alex to join and participate in your program directly at one of your centers. And um, I also wrote, read your book and the guidebook, which was tremendously helpful. And I, even though had only a very short time frame because my son had an accidental, um, well, he had a fentanyl poisoning, poisoning event that killed him. I was very much, I had the sense of feeling a little bit empowered and anchored because I saw some improvement in the communication between my son and myself. Mm. And unfortunately, I couldn't take that further because of the tragic accident. And I would like to um, have more people, if not the whole world, know about your work. Thank you. So Jeffrey, can you please share with us about the core mission of the Center for Motivation and Change. Um, sure, and thanks for having me here. And um, as you and I talked about a minute ago, this the, the pain that brings most people to this arena is pretty intense, um, whether they've lost someone or are just connected to somebody who's struggling or are the person struggling themselves. It's, uh, it's a very painful, place to inhabit um and um we uh <clears throat> we started our treatment centers uh, almost 20 years ago um in our outpatient center in new york city and and then about eight years ago a residential center which is where i am up here in the western part of massachusetts in the berkshires um uh, and that really was to try to bring, bring evidence-based approaches to um, the addiction treatment field. Um, and I, I've been in that field for now almost 35 years. <clears throat> um, and it's a field in terms of the professional ranks um, that is certainly populated by a bunch of people who care a lot and, and really work from their hearts and really want to help people make change. Um, and it's also been populated 
by a lot of traditional ideas about change and about substance use and about compulsive behaviors. Um, and those traditional ideas um, have, have been less helpful than they could be. Um, so <clears throat> what, we, what we do know over the last 40 years of research that's gone into treating substance use disorders, 50 years research, um, that there are a variety of things that help um, and, a, and a variety of ways of understanding these kind of struggles that are really useful. And um, so when we first started our treatment centers, it was really kind of to, to try to get a foothold in a world where there wasn't much going on in terms of um, evidence-based approaches. And that has changed some over the last 20 years. Um, it has changed not anywhere near as much as I would like it to have, or it should change. Um, so unfortunately, I think the field is still quite dominated by traditional sort of ideologically driven approaches, um, which can be helpful again for some subset of people, but we could just be much more helpful for much larger groups of folks um, and be more effective. Um, and then probably in the last 10 years, um, uh, we started to do some work uh, initially with the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids um, and uh, Tom Hedrick. Um, and uh, that was an initiative to kind of change the thrust of what was happening um, in the sense that instead of just focusing on professionals and trying to train them in more evidence-based ideas, could we approach this from a more peer-to-peer -peer level? Um, and could we empower and educate and train people who were lay people who didn't have anything to do with this world other than I'm a husband or I'm a parent now suddenly of somebody who's struggling and I have no idea what to do and it's terrifying. Um, so could we work with folks who are in that struggle and start to train them in ideas that would be more helpful to them. Um, and um, around that time, we also um, wrote Beyond Addiction. So that was seven or eight years ago, um, and uh, seven years ago, I guess. Um, uh, and the 20 Minute Guides as well, which were separate workbooks. Um, and <clears throat> those were really also with the exact same idea, which is we have these treatment centers where we really like the work we're doing. It feels very helpful to people. It's a new way of thinking about things. And even though it's a very large treatment program, for instance, in Manhattan, you know, we have 30 psychologists working there and, and treat, you know, 400 people. Um, that's a big treatment center and it's nothing. It's nothing in the world. Um, uh, um, uh, we're not out in California helping you and your son. We're not in Montana, we're not, and we'll never be. Um, we will never be able to have treatment programs and tre train enough treatment professionals for the size of the issue. It's just way too big. Um, and, you know, we're talking about tens of millions of people who have these kind of struggles. Um, <clears throat> probably 25 million people in this country at any given time who have a very, very serious substance issue. Um, that's a lot of people. and. So what, what can we do? Um, and part of what um, we started to focus on is we need to actually do this at a grassroots level. Um, we need to actually start to shift the conversation um, at, a, at, a, at a sort of person to person level in communities, as opposed to professionals and sort of trickling down to the relatively few number of people who will ever walk into a professional's office. And because that number of people is quite small. Um, and so how would we do that? And the partnership um, had the idea of training peer coaches uh, and having a phone-based training uh, uh, coach, peer coaching network. And so we were involved in developing all of the material for that, for that training for parents as lay, as lay coaches, as well as the whole process of training people. And the partnership was very good about developing an infrastructure for how do we have this spread around the country. <clears throat> Um, and then in the last five years, we um, do, opened a foundation, um, um, cmcffc.org. It's a foundation for change. Um, and um, that was really our attempt to 
also start to take all this work of bringing, bringing evidence-based ideas and practices into at a community level uh, and training people um, and disseminating this information at a community level um, to lay people. Um, that was, that's the purpose of our foundation. Um, uh, and so we have spent the last five years working on developing that. Um, and we have a, uh, based on all the work we've done over the last 10 years with families, um, um, we really, we really worked on the model. So we started out with a, a lot of craft community reinforcement and family training work to help families, the work of Bob Myers, um, which is just very helpful, very powerful evidence-based approaches for families. Um, and then realized there was a lot still that we wanted to incorporate that really families uh, uh, needed, um, whether they were, again, spouses or kids or parents, that they needed a lot more tools than, than were offered in craft alone. Um, and so the, the, this period of time now for a number of years has been really folding in based on, based on trainings we're doing with families and coming back and saying, okay, what, what didn't work there? What did work? What do they get? What don't they get? What do people need and we're not providing and really trying to find those tools. So the, the additional tools then in, in this toolbox have become are things from motivational interviewing, which is a treatment approach um, and acceptance and commitment therapy um, or ACT, which is another treatment approach and a lot of self-compassion work. Um, and all of those things combined now, we've sort of been working on how do you how do you understand this in a model that makes sense to people um, instead of saying a little of this, a little of that, a little of this. So the, the final model that we have developed at this point is something we call the invitation to change approach or the ITC. Um, there's a workbook for that, which we put out about four months ago um, called, you'd think I'd know the name of it, but I think it's... Uh, called uh, The Short Guide to the Invitation to Change or The Invitation to Change, A Short Guide, one of those two, um, but I can send you the links for it. <laughs> um, and um, that's a, a, a workbook that we use um, when we do trainings for, for communities. Um, it's, it's sort of at the same level uh, as the 20 minute guide. It's a you know, 100 page workbook uh, and it goes through all the ideas in the invitation to change, gives people practices to do and so forth. So that's our updated version of that kind of a workbook. Um, and I think it's a very powerful approach now, actually. It's because it really does bring in lots of new tools and, and concepts for people to help them understand this in a different way, uh, understand themselves in a different way, uh, and have some practical tools. And that's really what that whole model is about. Wow, you have given a lot of information right now. And some of my next questions uh, kind of circle around some of what you said. And I will probably cherry pick some in the course sure. of my next questions. Um, I think what you mentioned um, sounds so, um, is so sad. I read a number, I think I read it through some of your resources that there are approximately 23 million that uh, need treatment, but only 3 million reach out for actually reach out to get help. Yep, it's around 10%, yep. Yeah, that is uh, very sad. And um, also well, I- Well, when you think of the 23 million also, um, the other number that's helpful to keep in mind, I think, is the number of, of loved ones um, or people close to someone who is struggling is exponentially larger than. So it's, it's generally thought of as like three or four or five people directly affected by someone who's struggling at that level of severity. So if you took that 23 million, let's say, call it a number, call it that number and said, let's multiply that. Even if we took the conservative number of three, then you're talking about another 70 million people. Um, you know, that's a giant the underground population yeah. that's not yeah. served. And Which is um, part of why we were so interested in saying, can we talk to families? Because nobody's talking to families. Um, they have no idea what to do. They're terrified. They're on the front line. Bad things are really happening to people and their lives. It's incredibly destructive. And they're getting not such great information um, about how to help. When they finally do break through or break through the sense of stigma or shame about my kid is struggling or my husband is struggling and he's lost his job or my kid got kicked out of college or, you know, when, I, when I'm finally able to kind of ask for help, 
the kind of help I'm getting also is not really related to what we know is helpful. Um, yes, so yes. that's that's been a major motivation for us in terms of like saying we need to we need to help families and work with them. And I read something interesting too through your resources that even those parents and families who know that they are not really responsible for their child's struggle or addiction yeah. still don't reach out. So yeah. I believe this the stigma and shame are so huge. And I have to say, I was definitely also um there was shame there was embarrassment actually yep. Yep. um everyone else's kids seem to do great why is my yep. kid not doing great so yep. it does ask me as a parent to really go deep and reflect and see yep. is it really me and what else is going on and yep. Uh, yep. um yep. it's a very interesting and that's what i that's why i so connected with your approach because it's not about fixing the individual it's yep. really about going looking beyond and looking at all the dynamics in the family and the partners, the, the environment, and make it a whole group approach, basically. Yeah, it's sort of the one of the uh, one of the ideas behind the invitation to change approach. Now is that you, as a helper, are are part of the change. You know, you're not a surgeon operating on somebody in the surgical tent. Um, you're part of a system. You're part of a relationship, um, and I mean, I'm happy to give you the 60 seconds on the invitation to change, what, what we try to talk about in, in that, if it's useful, um, uh, just as a background, but really the ultimate, ultimately the, the model we've come to here is, um, it's a helping, it's trying to help helpers. <laughs> um, yes. And helpers could be therapists, professionals, her therapists could be, <clears throat> helpers could be parents, helpers could be a kid of a, you know, a grown kid of a parent, um, who's struggling, helpers could be friends. Um, and most of us don't have the tools uh, or the knowledge, <clears throat> excuse me, to know how to help effectively. And it's not that we don't want to, we desperately want to. Um, um, so in the Invitation to Change, we have this wheel, um, uh, which has lots of different spokes on it. Um, and there's basically three sections for how to help. One is helping with understanding. Um, so that's how can I understand what this person is going through differently? How can I get a different perspective on this? Um, um, and the, the next section is, how can I understand myself better? So helping with awareness, self-awareness. Um, and that includes checking in, understanding exactly the kind of things you were just saying. Wow, I feel, when I slow down a little bit, I realize I feel embarrassed by all this. I feel ashamed, I feel angry, I feel betrayed. I feel scared, I feel compassion, I feel all kinds of stuff that I'm just in a panic and I'm just barreling through, but I need to slow down. Um, and part of that, part of the helping with awareness is also the idea that this is gonna be painful. And I don't, the whole idea is not to, how do we get rid of pain? How do we make this problem go away and get past this and get back to normal? Um, it's how do I understand what's going on here and my loved one, because they're not crazy they're doing this for reasons that make sense to them. How do I understand myself in this process and understand what I'm going through and have some compassion for it and some tools for dealing with all the pain I'm going through. Mm -hmm. And the third section is helping with action. So communication strategies, how do I interact in ways that are gonna be more productive and less defensive for both of us and behavioral reinforcement strategies. How do I notice the positives and, and pick up on those and how do I set limits for things that are really not okay for me, you know? Um, and then the middle of the wheel is how do I practice is all of these things take practice. So none of these things are just, I just need, are not chit chat, like ideas that, that, um, are interesting. They're all based on practice. We're not good at that things we, that we haven't done before. So understanding my loved one in a new way takes practice, it takes me slowing down and going, okay, right. I've got to remember what's going on here. Being aware of myself, having some compassion towards myself, understanding the pain is going to be part of this. That takes practice. Um, using communication skills in a new way, um, that takes practice. So that the whole wheel is then focused on sort of compassionate practice. The whole idea of practice being compassion. Um, they're not going to be good at making these changes because they're new to them. I'm not going to be good at making these changes because it's new to me. Can we... Can we understand that and, and work together to kind of 
keep moving forward despite all the problems, all the flaws, all the lapses, all the different things that happen that are painful and difficult, you know? So that's, those are the sort of the central <laughs> ideas. That is so very interesting. And I'm afraid uh, I could talk with you for hours and uh, go deeper because that is such a vast comprehensive topic. And the reality is my experience, and you mentioned it also, is that the system and the concept current model is not working, at least in most part. Of course, there are some good things like your approaches, uh, but there aren't many like that. And there is a lot of work to done in this country for the treatment addiction, but also how do we understand addiction? Mm -hmm. I have heard so many stories from families who sent their kid who had substance use problems to one treatment center to the next, mm -hmm. sometimes five, six drug rehab centers, mm -hmm. thousands of dollars later without this true profound healing or success. Mm -hmm. And what do you think is the biggest myth about addiction that we carry in our culture? And how does that work against the person who actually needs the help? And how yeah. does society support that? Yeah. Um, well, the biggest myth, uh, it's a hard one because there's a lot of big myths. <laughs> um, I'm not sure on the greatest hits list of biggest myths, but um, certainly, um, certainly one that comes to mind um, in any discussion about substance issues is um, the idea that there is a, a singular thing called addiction um, and that one size fits all um, and that, and there's lots of negative tentacles to that idea, um, including stigmatizing language, um, you know, and by stigmatizing sort of meaning identifying traits and saying that everyone holds those traits and that that's the characteristic of this group and that's who they are. And that's sort of inherently an us versus them kind of an idea. It's also just blatantly not true um, that there is a thing called addiction. Um, or a thing called substance use disorder even. Um, but the, the, the real kind of like toxic part of that is then, then the languaging around that becomes, oh, the explanation for someone's behavior is they're, quote, they're an addict. And then you're in real difficult territory um, because, you know, as I have often said, if I looked around a group of people sitting here in our residential center, <clears throat> which I just walked out of a group of people, you know, and if I looked around that group of 10 people and said, um, what is your story? And how did you start to relate to substances? And how did that become problematic? And how is that going to change for you? It would literally be 10 different stories that didn't really resemble each other. It doesn't mean there's no overlap in common humanity in the way we all struggle with pain and so forth, but there isn't one singular explanation and there isn't one singular entity called substance use disorder. Um, uh, and again, uh, part of the downside of having this be the singular idea. Is, so I go to treatment and they do the same thing with everybody. That's what their treatment approach is, is the same thing. We sit in groups, we hear the same information. Um, they tell us that we're addicts. Um, they tell us that we're um, in denial. Um, they tell us that we have an addict brain. Um, they tell our family that they're um, codependent um, and um, uh, that they're enablers. Uh, and it's the same language over and over again. Um, and again, it's not true uh, and it's not helpful. Um, and what I really need is to know what's going on with me partic particularly. Um, so I'm, you know, 29 and I, um, I, I was in the military and saw bad things happen and I have PTSD and, um, I can't get things out of my head and I drink a ton and it really helps. And it's really having a downside because now I can't work very well and I keep getting fired from stuff, but the drinking helps me. And I'm 55 and I had a car accident three years ago and I have chronic pain because my discs got all messed up and I got a bunch of Percocets and they really help my pain sort of at times, but other times they do. And I just use a ton of them and I like it. Um, and my wife is up in arms and kicking me out. Um, 
and I'm 15 and I smoke pot every day from dawn till dusk. And it's the one thing that lets me go to school because um, otherwise I'm so anxious I can hardly get out of bed. Um, and we're saying all those people have the same thing. Hmm. And they're yes. not even remotely the same. <coughs> You know, and the things that are going to yeah. help those people are not even remotely the same. And that reminds me very much of my uh, being a chronic pain physical therapist. I could talk about the same in, mm -hmm. in that arena as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a different story and a different reason why they ended up in chronic pain. And yet there is a common thread to it as well. Mm -hmm. um, the approaches you're working with, how are they different than some of the traditional ones? what do you think is the missing link in most current or traditional addiction treatment concepts out there? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, the, one of the essential threads in, I think, in evidence-based treatments is um, paying attention to motivation uh, and paying in, attention to uh, internal reasons for change, including what are my values. Um, and <clears throat> That's a different view than, than the idea that I have a disease, um, which then is sort of doesn't have that much to do with me. It's this thing that happened to me. Um, uh, and unfortunately, some, some of the disease model that got developed and sort of came out in the late 70s and uh, uh, Betty Ford was part, partly uh, part of that. You know, when that disease model became much more prevalent in the US, um, that was a godsend in certain ways, um, which is that it was, you know, a, a president's wife saying I had a problem with alcohol was a stigma busting thing to do and a um, shame reducing thing to do. And then we can call it a disease just like diabetes. And then people are not nearly ashamed of having diabetes. They may not like it, but they don't feel like they have to hide that from people. Um, so that I think initially was a quite positive step in destigmatizing substance issues. But then um, the, the degree to which it becomes this monolithic description um, takes on a life of its own. Um, and again, becomes this thing that I have or that happened to me, uh, as opposed to like the reasons I just went through a minute ago um, of I'm 15 and I'm anxious. I'm, you know, I'm 29 and I have PTSD. I'm 55 and I have chronic pain. Um, I lost my wife, I'm grieving, I'm, I'm all the different things that we as human beings go through that affect us and substances work. Substances help those problems. So there's nothing wrong or weird about wanting to get that kind of relief from problems. Ultimately, when it develops at the level of a substance use disorder, it's bringing its own set of problems along that are making things probably worse now. But it's still it still was started and is continuing for reasons that still make sense to me. So this change process, this consideration of maybe I won't do this as much anymore or at all needs to be something that makes sense to me. And that's what we mean by motivation. Um, why am I doing this? Um, and um, uh, what's important to me about this process of change? Because change is hard for everybody. So it better be worth it. Um, and what, what's going to be on the other side of that that's useful as a life that I can move towards? You know, if you think of like the one of the most ridiculous uh, and misguided campaigns ever was the just say no idea um, of Nancy Reagan. Um, and that was a disastrous concept, really, like a harmful public service message that has persisted for years. Uh, and fits into a certain part of the American psyche, which is you're weak, just get over it, just buck up. Um, and that's not what substance use problems are about. Um, so just saying no on the most basic level is, is a ridiculous idea. So I just say no to the things that are helping me, which is drinking, helps me sleep. Otherwise, I have, I have terrors at night and I can't even go down. I can't even lie down hardly. Um, so it helps me. So you're suggesting that I just, just say no, just stop doing this thing and have no alternative. That's a bad deal. It's not one I'm going to buy into because I'm not an idiot um, and I shouldn't buy into that kind of a bad deal. You want me to exchange something for nothing. Um, so 
the some of the essential elements of of helpful evidence-based treatment approaches are ones that focus on why is this important to you and what are you going to start to create in a life for, as a life that means something to you um and then you could walk towards that instead of walking away from some negative you're walking towards something positive and that's kind of the basis of motivational work it's the basis of behavioral change strategies it's the basis of craft that we talked about of bob myers um, which is can we start to focus on what my my family member who's struggling what else can they start to have in their life not how do we get them to stop this like an intervention for instance is an attempt to just shut this down send them away cut this behavior out and we're good right they went to a rehab they went to a wilderness camp and those people just extracted that from their brain and now they're good to go that's ludicrous and not true and harmful um, yes. and something like craft is based on how do we as a family change how do we learn how to be supportive of positive things in your life how do we help help start to help identify what those things could be understand some of the challenges you have to finding those things and to living those things um, all of that is like a whole system change you know not just we want you to do something different and we want you to forget about this bad stuff this makes so much sense and that's why i resonated so strongly with that approach you're dealing with a human being with a life story and you yeah. want to empower that person and you believe and know based on science that they have the capacity each person has the capacity to change right. there are many bad deals out there for parents i remember i went to one support group right early on when i found out my son was addicted about for families who had some a loved one with substance use problems everyone introduced themselves and they were coming for a long time i was the new kid on the block in that circle mm -hmm. hi i'm so and so and i'm an enabler i refused for myself i did not say that because i knew that wasn't true wow. loving my son and raising the floor for him and wanting to learn how i can support him is not right. enabling right. and while there are enabling tendencies and i'm sure there are enabling situations but i don't believe that's the, at least for me it wasn't true so yeah. i felt the labeling and the stigmatizing was so prevalent and it really yeah. didn't serve me yeah no i hope, totally agree with you and 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 if you step back and look at the group of people who are trying to take on these issues it's family members and again as we talked about earlier it's millions and millions of people to put them in a hole and say you also should stop doing these negative behaviors as opposed to saying welcome and thank you for loving your loved one so much and yeah. having such a commitment to helping them and having such great impulses to be a helper um, yeah. and here's some positive tools for helping better like it seems like that's what you'd want not let's shame you now for somehow this problem even existing you know and just yeah. assume, assuming that somehow it's related to you and somehow it's your fault, um, which if I'm asked to sit in a group and introduce myself as an enabler without any discussion about anything that's going on in my life, then right, you're blaming me, right? So you are clearly changing the narrative about addiction and how to look at it and how to approach it for healing. Can you give us maybe a little bit of glimpse? Let's say there's a family who has a teen daughter or son who struggles, who uses substances, but has no interest to stop nor wants to get help. Yeah. But the parents contact your center. What could be the first steps? Uh, what would the family maybe um, look at and work through? Yeah. So um, again, if we're, if we're thinking of this as a, um, if I'm wanting to help, um and and we're suggesting part of helping is including yourself in this process um that's a immediately kind of a profound change in the whole equation um because lots of times i would get a call from someone saying my husband my kid can you fix them um can you make them stop because i can't um and truthfully the answer to that is no actually you're going to be a much more powerful force in this change process than i could ever be you may not have the right tools right now and we can certainly talk about that but you got a lot more going for you than i do in this equation um you know them you're motivated uh you're going to stay at this 24 7. um uh you love them <laughs> um and um you'll kind of do anything so 
that's a pretty good helper um, as a as a job description. That, you know, you're on your resume <laughs> as your starting point, um, and maybe we can add in some tools to that. But like seventy percent of this, you already have the power of, um, and we're happy to try to put another thirty percent on your on your resume there. Um, but like you're off to a good start by the fact that you even called. Um, and um, your kid, your husband, your whoever is saying, hell no, I won't go. I don't want to do this. I, I don't want to talk about this. Leave me alone. Okay, let's take them at their word for a minute and have you start to think about what can be different for you. Um, how can you start to take care of yourself? Because this is really stressful. Um, and that's, by the way, something that people would hear about in Al-Anon, for instance, uh, you know, self-care, you know, needing to step back and take care of themselves. The difference in terms of some of these uh, more evidence-based ideas is that Al-Anon has really, really focused on, on taking care of, of, the, of the family member, noticing themselves in the equation and taking care of themselves. Un unfortunately, it, it often, not always, but it often can get paired with this idea of detaching. I need to, to do that, to take care of myself. I need to, to step away from you and detach. And you're going to find this, you, my loved one, are going to change when you're ready. And really what's much closer to the truth is that as helpers, we can help you get ready and we can take care of ourselves. Both of those things can happen at the same time. They're not mutually exclusive. So... It may start with me kind of trying to checking in with myself and noticing myself, noticing what I'm going through, finding ways to take care of myself, having some compassion. Um, but it doesn't have to mean I can't also start to understand where you're coming from, even if you don't want to change right now. Um, even if you're adamantly like, I don't want to hear about this kind of stuff. Okay, let me try to get my head around what's going on over there on that side of the street, you know? Um, and, and this is a big part of craft, how could I start to change things within our relationship? Even if you're saying, don't talk to me about this stuff, I don't want to hear about it, doesn't mean I can't start to change other aspects. What we would, what we would describe as creating the conditions for change. Um, and creating the conditions for change is different than demanding a change right now. Demanding a change from another person about anything is usually not a winning strategy. You have to start exercising tomorrow. We're going to lay out your schedule and you're going to follow it. You know it's bad for your health. You know okay. how often is that an effective strategy? Not very often. Uh, it's not an effective strategy for helping someone else. It's not usually an effective strategy for helping ourselves. This is my New Year's resolution. Okay, who cares? For 24 hours, you cared about it, but it wasn't actually a, an effective supporting way to, to help yourself start to change and do something different. So... Can I, as a family member, support myself, understand you differently, and start to incorporate some, some different ways of relating that are going to create conditions here? So you're used to me looking at you funny all the time uh, with a stink eye and being mad at you and being ready to pounce on you for everything and smelling your breath every time you come in and looking at my watch every time you go out. And um, how can I start to do things differently, you know, that are maybe easing off of some of that and going, and what, what are you doing positively? Can I start to notice any of that? So you're not high all the time um, and you're for half the day around the house and you're totally pleasant and I really appreciate that. And can I start to notice that stuff also? If all I'm, gonna, if all I'm able to notice because this has been so difficult is all the negatives and all the shoes about to drop, that's the pattern we get into. Um, is just that kind of repetitive pattern of negativity. Um, and can I start to notice other things and what you would describe as reinforce, reinforce other things. I really appreciated you um, getting up in time to get the garbage out this morning. You know, thanks a lot for taking your sister to school. Um, uh, I'm just introducing different elements to our relationship now that weren't here because we were all fraught about, oh, I can't believe he's doing this and, you know, he said he wasn't going to be more than he did. And, you know, that's all we're focusing on. And it just stays really stuck and jammed up. So those are the things that I think if someone calls me and says, my kid won't change, my husband won't change, what should I do? Okay, let's think about what you can do for yourself and for them, for the, for the whole family that starts to be, feel different in that household, you know?
That was one of the key pieces for me when I learned through reading your book and using the guidebook, the communication skills, the positive reinforcement, mm -hmm. such as really pulling out the small little changes, tiny, yep. Yep. Um, maybe getting up 30 minutes uh, earlier than three hours later. Yep. And um, or a 30, 30 minutes delayed versus three hours delayed and things like that, where I'm yeah. like, wow, Alex, I noticed you're much more on time today. This is awesome. And mm -hmm. whereas right. there is a tendency past pattern, including myself, yep. to wanting to lecture. Yep. Of course, I think I know what needs to happen. Right. And so that was 180 um, shift and I could tell the changes. And I think rewriting what the Center for Motivational for motivation and change focuses on and your book beyond addiction is the positive reinforcement and that includes concepts such as motivational interviewing acceptance and commitment uh, therapy and the craft model can you please explain briefly what does craft actually stand for craft yes uh, that so that was something that grew out of uh, in the 70s and 80s there was a development of a treatment approach uh, by a guy, a psychologist named Nate Azrin, um, uh, called uh, the Community Reinforcement Approach, CRA. And um, that was a pretty straightforward behavioral approach for how do we reinforce positive behavior change? Um, and uh, CRA still exists and people still do it. Um, it's, in fact, if you looked at the data on the effectiveness of CRA as a treatment approach for someone who's using substances, it's the most, it's, I think the most powerful approach we have. Uh, it's also the one that if you ever said to anybody, do you do CRA, they would have no idea what you were talking about and no one knows about it. So that's not so awesome. Um, um, Bob Myers worked with Nate Azrin, then Bob Myers moved to, uh, to Albuquerque and started working with Bill Miller, who is one of the developers of motivational interviewing. And I think Bill Miller encouraged Bob to develop the CRA model for families. Um, so CRA FT, that's what Kraft is, CRA, and then you put family therapy. So it's community reinforcement and family therapy. Um, and it's basically the same principles as CRA, which I'll explain in one second, but for families. So it's, it was sort of one of the early times and one of the first times in the treatment world where we said, let's pay attention to the families. How about that for an idea? Not just to the person who's struggling. Um, and it was specifically designed <laughs> and then tested in a set, series of research trials um, as an approach that you worked with family members when they had a loved one who was struggling with substances and didn't want to change, which is a lot of people. Ah, I don't want to hear about that. You're always bugging me about my drinking, you know? Um, no, everybody does it, mom. You know, it's no big deal. All that stuff, which is where a lot of people are in their substance use um, struggle or not struggle. Um, and the family members are like freaking out and thinking this is not good. Things are bad, bad things are happening and so forth. And they don't want to hear about it, that my, my kid, my husband doesn't want to hear about it. So what can I do? So community reinforcement and family training, craft. it was one of the early approaches for working with just the family when your kid or your husband is not even in the office and never might ever be. Um, and, and it's a way of training the family members to use things like better communication skills that are going to help people not be defensive positive reinforcement strategies so I can notice positive changes and not just be focusing on the negative. Um, skills for taking care of myself and setting limits. Um, uh, focusing on reinforcing, um, uh, uh, focusing on helping my loved one find things in the, in the community, that's where the community part of this comes from, uh, that are reinforcing as a life. Yeah, they just been in their room all the time. So we're gonna try to figure out ways that are that work for them that are going to be involving them in activities that they care about more um, and again from the cra approach we know that having people start to pay attention to stuff that that's meaningful for them in their life is a huge part of them deciding to make change so in craft you have things like a job club and those kind of things um, uh, so that people can start to get over some of the hurdles that they haven't gotten over previously that allow them to start to have a more meaningful life. Uh, and then that competes basically with my substance use. 
So that's what CRA and CRAFT is about. And CRAFT, again, specifically for training family members on how to do all that kind of work. Um, and then the invitation to change, as I said, is, is adding in further elements of motivational interviewing and, and acceptance and commitment therapy. So, Jeffrey, are there data out there, statistics that compare concepts like CRAFT or yeah. um, Center for Motivational Change concepts with other more current models? Yeah, so CRAFT has been around since the invitation to change is just a, a new set of ideas. Um, we don't have any data on it yet. Um, what we do have on CRAFT, which really was developed in the, in the mid and late 90s, uh, there have been probably 10 or 15 studies on CRAFT um, for training family members in helping the change process. And they have been incredibly positive. Um, I remember actually literally looking at a poster of their work back in 2002, maybe. I was at a conference and I was standing by my poster about something, I don't remember what it was. And I walked down the aisle and there was a poster presenting data about a craft study. And I literally thought, you guys must be lying because these results are incredibly positive and you never see results that are that positive in a, in a treatment trial. Usually it's like, we beat out the other treatment by a little bit and we, yay, we won. In this case, it was a trial comparing, um, a random, randomized control trial comparing inviting family members to learn craft versus referring them to Al-Anon versus nothing. <clears throat> uh, no, excuse me, versus the Johnson intervention. So there's interventions and then there's referral to Al-Anon and then there was craft. And the craft had a six, something like a 65% engagement rate of the family member who was str struggling. Um, the um, <clears throat> intervention had a 30% engagement rate and uh, Al-Anon had a like a 10% engagement rate. Now, Al-Anon is not meant to engage their family member in substance abuse treatment, but they just put it in the trial because that's a very common referral that people get. And they sort of want to see, well, what does that result in for the person who's actually struggling uh, with the substances? Um, so that they have consistently gotten results like that in these craft trials when they put them head to get head against other approaches. And it's really quite, quite profound. Can you give us some example of um, a positive communication, maybe just one or two examples? Sure. Uh, and again, a lot of the positive communication work comes from motivational interviewing, which is a very powerful set of tools for communication strategies, really. How do we talk to people in a way that they'll listen? Um, uh, I, I, I could start and stop with the, literally I just talked about this in a group I was just in here and people were talking about um, their, their relationships and the struggles they were having. Uh, and the biggest problem for everybody was they don't listen. Um, they're always litigating against me and um, one of the exercises we do with people is just what we call simply listening. So you can have more sophisticated strategies for reflection and open-ended questions um, and affirmations. And those are all very powerful strategies, but none of those will work if you can't actually listen. Um, and just starting with it, what seems like a very basic, simple concept, but is actually can be very hard to do is we have them practice sitting in a group, uh, sitting in a dyad with another person, having that person explain an issue that they're struggling with and not say anything for two minutes and just listen to them. And the effect of that is profound for the speaker to have an experience of like, oh, I realized, I kept realizing you weren't going to interrupt me. You weren't gonna start giving me suggestions. You weren't gonna tell me something that made you think about some of the experience you've had. You were actually just listening. And for the listener to be able to sit with the idea of like, I wanna say all these things, I wanna help, I wanna be a helpful person, and I'm not, I'm just gonna to listen to you, is, is a very profound change for lots of people. Uh, that would be a good practice for so many of us, um, yeah. for the world out there. Yeah. Jeffrey, before we come closer to the end here, one of the key questions now that comes up for me, so how can we capture more of those that need this work? Um, so uh, we've spent years now with this uh, developing this foundation work and and trying to train people at the community level. Um, so you can certainly start with us in terms of um, the cmcffc.org work. That's that's 
our attempt to start to do this at a grassroots level. So as a lay person or a family member, I think trying to get connected with those kind of resources, whether it's through the reading stuff um, or whether it's getting trained yourself, the whole idea of that for us is developing, uh, we've developed all these materials to hand over to people and say, just do it. You know, here's how you run a group. Here's the material, go for it. We'll train you and then don't talk to us. I mean, we'll support you if you want to, but you don't need to come to us. You don't need to pay us. There's nothing, just, just this is for communities to do groups and start to change the culture and start to change the language um, uh, uh, at a community level. Um, so part of that, I think, would also then drive consumers, families coming to treatment providers and saying, what are you talking about? Don't, don't talk to me like that. And what do you mean you don't know anything about craft? Like, what's the matter? Like, you should learn stuff. Um, and demanding more in that level from professionals, too. So from my perspective, it's started to try to drive this stuff from a ground up level and a grassroots level. I definitely want to promote that and share that with my community and designated organizations and individuals. And so when parents who listen to this want to find out more, they could, for example, visit your website, the Center for Motivation and Change. And I must say your website is awesome. It's in very inviting, very informative, and it also has resources. And I yep. noticed there is a weekly Zoom class or a weekly Zoom meeting that you yep. offer for parents yep. for learning uh, with different topics each week. Yep. And uh, anything else, Jeffrey, that parents can do to dive into this? Um, again, I think reading reading stuff that's that's more evidence based. Um, starting to get some of these ideas. You know, Bob Myers has a, a great book for families: Get Your Loved One Sober. Um, uh, uh, Maya Salowitz has written some nice books about um, substance issues um, uh, recently. Um, um, uh, Pat Denning and Jeannie Little wrote a book called um, uh, uh, Over the Influence, um, which is about harm reduction. And harm reduction shares a lot of ideas in this same way about starting where people are at, not demanding change, but it's kind of like starting where someone what someone can tolerate and moving from there so uh, those are kind of i think written resources book resources that are all very helpful awesome and i will definitely list and highlight more i have your books listed on my on my son's memorial website alex for hope but i want to over this weekend highlight more of your work and um, promote it more so and uh, also, please send me the other guidebook that you shared about. Will. This thing. Yeah. Uh, so I can list that as well. I will. And uh, I'm just really thanking you so much for having spent this hour with me. Sure. And I will share this with as many people that can be interested in this and want to invite everyone to 